Hi guys, good morning and thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to see you guys here live and in person this year. No offense to last year, but this is like way more cool and way more fun. So I'm really excited. So my topic today, you guys can see, is pacemakers. And the reason I chose it is because when I was a resident, I feel like I was intimidated a little bit by this group of patients. And I think I just overcomplicated it. This is this talk is just going to be a very simple, straightforward way of assessing and treating these patients, right? When we talk about pacemakers, there's two categories of patients that come in, right? There's the patients who have one already, and you need to figure out whether or not it's working properly, right? And then there's the people who need one, and they need to be bridged to definitive treatment and management. So in either case, step one is always going to be read the EKG or monitor, right? And that sounds like it should be easy. How many of you in this room are ready to be attendings? Nobody. All right, cool. Hopefully by the end of this lecture, you're going to be one step closer, okay? What I'm going to show you is the way in attending uh, a reads an EKG, right? You have to look at an EKG and within a couple of seconds, you have to make some snap judgments. And for me, that decision is to decide whether or not to get up out of my chair. Um, some of my residents are back there. They know that at my shop, these chairs are very comfortable and something has to be really scary for me to get up out of that chair, that super comfy chair. Sorry, this is making me laugh. My kids play a role in every one of my presentations. And so this picture is their contribution. Okay, Mike Wazowski. In any case, what is scary on the EKG or monitor in these patients? In the patients who have one already, a scary EKG or monitor is signs that a pacemaker is failing, right? Signs of pacemaker failure. And I'm going to talk about what that looks like. And the people who need one, obviously, it's signs that they need one, some evidence of like super being super Brady or a complete heart block or something like that. So I think that category is pretty straightforward. When they're really Brady or they have some obvious need of a pacemaker and you need to get involved, put the pacer pads on, I think that stands out to everybody. But I'm going to focus a little bit on this group of people who have one. What are the clues, right? What are some dead giveaways? of pacemaker failure. So I'm gonna break it down in three simple things to remember. So number one, are there evidence of pauses or gaps? Now, this is not from a textbook, I just made this stuff up. Just bear with me, it will become clear very soon. So pauses or gaps. Number two, is there a lack of a response or a, an inappropriate response to the pacemaker firing, right? There's a fire, something has to happen after that. And if something doesn't happen, that's a problem. And is that rate, the ventricular rate, is that abnormal? It should be normal, right? They're always set at a certain rate, but if it's too low or too high, then that's a sign that something has gone wrong. Or as my kids would say, that's sus, mom, that's sus. So in this case, you see this little strip here. From, from the back of the room, you can see there's a little gap in the middle, there's a pause. And in the first two complexes you see, there's a P wave, there's a ventricular contraction after a pacer spike, and they look normal, the first two complexes. But then you see a P wave, and then you see a pause or gap. And so what happened here? The pacemaker didn't fire, and it's because it incorrectly sensed that something happened, a ventricular contraction occurred, by the native rhythm, which didn't happen, and it inhibited itself. So it oversensed, right? So this pause is a sign that it oversensed, which is an indication of pacemaker malfunction. So again, you don't have to remember all the words, oversensing, undersensing. You just have to look at this pause and this gap and be like, nope, that's sus. All right, clue number two. Again, from the back of the room, you can see that there's some pauses here. And in this case, the pause happens after the pacemaker spike. You got a boom, you got a pacemaker fire, and then nothing happened in a couple of these moments. And so that also shouldn't happen, right? You should have a response. And so that's a sign of something called failure to capture. So again, this is something you can identify in a second, right? You look at this EKG, boom, right away you notice it's a problem. You see that pause or gap. Here's another strip, here's another clue, okay? In this clue, you see some evidence of pacemaker firing, but you don't see that immediate ventricular response right after that spike. Here you're seeing that it's probably not able to do that, right? Because these pacemakers 
firings are happening a little bit at random. Because if you look at the native rhythm, you see a P wave, you see a QRS corresponding QRS complex, and it's a bundle branch pattern, but still matches up. The rate is normal. So this is probably a perfusing rhythm. And so if the pacemaker was adequately sensing this, it would inhibit itself and not fire, right? But that's not happening. It is not sensing what's going on. It is just, bam, just firing away, irrespective of what's happening. And so in this case, this is a an an unusual response or a lack of a response to the pacemaker firing, again, that's a sign of failure and that's called under sensing. It didn't sense what's going on or it's in some kind of asynchronous pacing mode where it's just pacing irrespective of what's happening. And in somebody with a device, that's not supposed to happen, right? Sus, all right. Let us apply our skills for a moment. I don't know if you guys are able to see this well, so just, try to think through what I was talking to you about. Do you see any pauses or gaps? Do you see any lack of a response on this EKG? How many people are gonna get up out of their chair? I see some hands. Yes, all right, good. All right, so we're making headway. So we do see some pauses or gaps here. You see a couple of spots right here in AVL, AVF, right? You see a P wave and then nothing, and then a P wave and then nothing. And then on this side, in V5 and V6, you see some very clear spikes with nothing happening after that. So you have two signs, right, of, of pacemaker malfunction. And certainly you should be getting up out of your chair, right? Get up. Unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, I have to get up. Here's another EKG, and this might be a little bit less clear from the back of the room, but in this EKG, do you see any pauses or gaps? No, no pauses or gaps. Do you see any evidence of a firing with nothing afterward, a failure to capture? No, good, everyone's shaking their head no. But what we do see here is that the rate is fast. The rate is fast. The rate is over 100 here. And that's something that you can probably tell from the back of the room. It's too fast. It should never be this fast. Pacemakers are set at rates of 60 or 70. And when it's going that fast, something might be wrong. And in older pacemakers, this is actually the first sign that it's going down the tubes and needs a new battery. And in fact, they can devolve quickly into a fatal arrhythmia. And so you need to get involved here and you need to treat this with a magnet. All right, so now you guys are getting to be pros at assessing these EKGs. I'm gonna give you a little bit more of a challenging EKG here. I'm gonna give you a moment to take a look and assess this EKG. So do you see any signs of pauses or gaps? Failure to capture? Rates looks good. So it looks like the pacemaker is functioning how many of you would get up out of your chair for this EKG? All right, I see a few hands. Anybody want to volunteer guess? Why are you getting up? She said STEMI. Yes, yes. So there's a smart group here. You guys are on the ball. So this was a trick one. So certainly there's no sign of pacemaker failure. However, there are signs of ST elevation. And just a reminder that Scarbosa's criteria can apply to V-paced EKGs. And so that's another reason to get up and see the patient because it's gonna really change your management. They need some immediate treatment. Reasons, again, to get up out of your chair in these paced patients. Number one, okay, pacemaker malfunction, right? Signs of pacemaker malfunction, we went through that. Number two is if they're a scarbosis patient, right? They meet scarbosis criteria, you need to do something. And then number three is if they have obvious signs that they need a pacemaker, they don't have a device already. All right, so we went through step one, read the EKG or monitor. Step two is now we got up out of our chair, we gotta go see the patient. That's assuming that you're not already at the bedside, but if you're not already at the bedside, like most attendings are, we're just sitting in the room, we have to get up, we gotta go see the patient because we gotta correlate the symptoms, right? The signs and symptoms that might be concerning, do they have chest pain, do they have shortness of breath, they have lightheadedness, something that makes me think that they're having problems with perfusion, right? Or maybe they have physical signs of poor perfusion. Correlating those symptoms is gonna be really important because everyone's seen that old lady who is like Brady in the 30s and she is just a lot talking like she's fine, right? So not that patient are we scared about, but these other patients who are a little bit looking worrisome, having worrisome symptoms, we need to get involved and we need to initiate immediate treatment. 
Just a caveat, don't miss that bradyarrhythmia that's caused by a hyper-K or an AV nodal blocker. Obviously, those are going to need some specific treatments. And then certainly make sure you get a, a, an x-ray to look for lead displacement. There's a, this, I don't know how well you can see this lead is not overlying the ventricle. It is up in the brachial plexus region, and that is not going to give you capture, right? Don't miss these couple of things in terms of troubleshooting your pacers. All right, so now you're going to initiate treatment, okay? And what's that going to involve? In some cases, it's going to just be meds. You're going to give them some atropine. Maybe they're going to need pressors. You're going to put a magnet on some of those tachyarrhythmias. You're going to need to go to the cath lab for those patients that are stable enough to do so and are meeting STEMI criteria. And then, barring that, if those things fail and or they're not stable to go to the cath lab, then you need to initiate emergency pacing in the department, right? So let's talk about how to do that. So in patients, as a review, who have a device already, you can pace those patients externally despite them having a, a device. You just have to make sure that the pads are in the anterior-posterior configuration and that the anterior pad is at least eight centimeters below the device. I had a little drawing on there. It was a terrible drawing. It's fine. It's missing. So anyway, and then you're going to hook it up to your defibrillator monitor device, your life pack. I'm not supposed to say life pack, just pretend I didn't say it. You're going to focus on this, on a little green box in the corner that says pacer. So you select the pacer mode, and then you're going to set the rate. The number on this picture is 80. A lot of people love that number. As long as the number is 20 beats above their baseline heart rate, you're going to pick that number and set the rate, and then you're going to pick an amplitude. I like the number 50 because I have never had capture below that number, but you start at an amplitude and then you go up until you get capture. If you get to a number of 120 or higher, you have to consider that this has failed and you need to get the stuff that you need to set up for transvenous pacing while you recite the pads and then start over and try again. Okay. And that brings me to transvenous pacing, okay? So all those things have failed. You've got an abnormal EKG. You've got a patient that's worrisome and they're unstable. And cardiology isn't immediately available to do something about it. And then you need to float a pacer. Um, for those of us who have floated Swan-Gans catheters, this is very similar. But for everybody else, this is a rare procedure. And we need to mentally rehearse these steps so that we feel comfortable when that moment comes. My personal preference is that I put a cordis in all of these patients and put the catheter through the cordis, but never fear. You have got plenty of access. You don't have a cordis. You don't need a cordis. If you call for a pacer catheter that will, from our MRI shop comes from cardiology. A lot of ERs have this in stock. Many different companies make it, but a pacemaker catheter kit contains an introducer. And that introducer is put in just like a central line. And that's what your catheter wire will go through. Okay. The other things that you need are all coming in this kit. We'll talk about that. But there's a couple of things that don't come in the kit that you need to ask for separately. So you're going to need a pacemaker generator and a fresh battery. Just make sure sometimes they have like older batteries. You don't want to use a device that's going to conk out in a few minutes and the person can't transfer where they need to go, right? So make sure you have a fresh battery for this pacer generator. The knobs on it are the same as that little green box on your your life pack defibrillator pacer. You're going to set the rate, the amplitude, and then you're going to have the sensitivity. But all the knobs should be facing up when you start. That's the simplest thing to remember. You can have an ultrasound machine, especially if you didn't already have one in the room for putting your central line in the first place. And then you're going to have your favorite med student or any other kind soul to be your non-sterile assistant. Okay? I want to help. <laughs> This, we'll see if this video works, but this is a video, because the video is worth a thousand words, of somebody putting this in, okay? And is there a way to play it? So what happens in this video is they're put, it won't play. So we'll go back. So what happens in the video is they put the introducer in that goes in one step with the dilator. You know how like when you put in a central line, you put in a dilator and then you come back out. This all goes in one step, just like with a cordis, and then the dilator comes back out. And then you prep the wire, you check the balloon and make sure that you put this contamination sheath onto it. And then you slide the whole thing in 
and advance it slowly until about 20 centimeters. Then the balloon goes up and the pacemaker generator goes on. Now you're gonna advance very slowly while you're watching the monitor. And you're gonna look for a couple of things. You're gonna look for that pacemaker spike and something that looks like a PVC, or alternatively, this little picture down here of this kind of STEMI type pattern. And that's gonna be a sign that your wire is in the right spot. And if you're confused at all, you just put the ultrasound on there. Your non-serial assistant can help you with that. And with the ultrasound, you're gonna be able to see that the wire is in the right spot in the ventricle. And then you can just simply turn up the amperage until you get capture, okay? Other signs of capture is that their perfusion is gonna improve, right? Their heart rate that you set on the generator is gonna match the number on the pulse ox and on the monitor. All right, so just to review, so we're getting at the end of my time here. We now reviewed the things that constitute a scary EKG or monitor in these patients with pacemakers, evidence of pacemaker malfunction, scarbosas, and then certainly if they need a pacemaker, you're going to get up now and go see the patient and identify whether or not they have symptoms or signs that correlate with something that needs an immediate intervention. And in that patient that is refractory to meds and or needs is unstable and cardiology isn't available, now you know what to do in terms of initiating pacing and how to do that. Oh.